DX worker. An audio strike against a monotone world. A twice monthly podcast of anarchist ideas and action. For everyone who dreams of a life off the clock. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 28th episode of The X Worker. Today, we're going to continue our exploration of anarcha feminism. We'll revisit the anarchist women of the late 19th and early 20th century, whose lives we discussed in episode 26, and examine their distinctive analyses of gender and power. With their radical perspectives on women's suffrage, marriage, the family, economic and bodily autonomy, and revolutionary sexism, this first generation of anarcha feminists got everybody angry and, in the process, laid the groundwork for more radical feminisms and more thorough anarchisms of the future. On the chopping block, we'll take a look at Free Women of Spain, Martha Acklesberg's classic study of Mujeres Libres during the Spanish Civil War. I'm Alanis. And I'm Clara, and we'll be your hosts. Okay, Clara, so back in episode 26, we surveyed the lives of late 19th century and early 20th century women active in anarchist struggles. But one thing that was missing was what these women actually thought, what they fought for, what critiques they made of society, and of the male-dominated movements they interacted with. Well, come on, Alanis, that was already our longest episode ever. We couldn't fit everything in there. I know, I know. But this time around, I'd like to focus on that dimension of anarcho-feminist history, the emergence and development of the anarchist challenge to patriarchy. Sounds good to me. Let's get started by looking at the context from which these early anarchist women emerged. What was going on? What were the anarchists who were not feminists saying about gender and revolution or the feminists who were not anarchists? Okay, we'll get there. But first, backing up just a little bit. So, coming out of the Middle Ages into the early modern era, capitalism began to emerge in Europe with the enclosures of public and common lands and the imposition of private property relations onto more and more spheres of life. One consequence of this is increasing urbanization, as peasants flock to cities when older communal forms of village living are disrupted. This process of enclosure and accumulation is happening around the world, with colonization, theft of indigenous land, and mass enslavement, and also on the level of gender and the body, as the European witch hunts institute a reign of terror that appropriate women's reproductive labor. All of these processes lay the groundwork for the capitalist economy to begin spreading its tentacles around the world and deeper into our daily lives. With this new economic order emerging, and technological advances in manufacturing, we get the Industrial Revolution, beginning in Western Europe in the mid to late 18th century and then expanding around the world. Production is shifting away from the village and the family and into the city and the factory. This results in huge shifts in family life and gender roles, and a new sense of public and private spheres, with the public, meaning wage labor and participation in politics, gendered male, and the private, meaning the family and the home, gendered female. Got it? Got it. Great. As these economic and gender shifts are remaking society, there are corresponding political shifts. Enlightenment thought focuses on the individual as the key social and political unit and advocates for universal rights, and the American and French revolutions mark the beginning of a new era. And don't forget about the Haitian Revolution, where formerly enslaved people rise up and kill their masters, and raise the specter of slavery and colonial domination coming to a violent end. Exactly. So what does all of this mean for women? Well, as more and more men enter the urban industrial workforce and the economy comes to rely more and more on the unwaged labor of women doing domestic work and childcare, women are losing forms of social and economic power they had previously shared in more interdependent village contexts. And this division into public and private spheres leads women out of the new notions of the Republican fraternity of universal male rights. This is the discourse that Mary Wollstonecraft is trying to intervene in when she writes A Vindication of the Rights of Women in 1792. When women joined in the wage labor force, often out of dire necessity due to the impoverishment resulting from low wages and enclosure of the commons, they not only earned lower wages in often wretched conditions, but were severely vulnerable to male violence and exploitation. And at the same time, the ideology of separate spheres and reliance on their unwaged labor meant that women were frequently doubly exploited as workers and as wives. That's rough. Yep. 
So both early socialists and radicals, as well as proto-feminists, advanced different ideas for how to transform this crappy situation for workers, women, and, well, most of society. One solution to the emerging impoverishment and alienation of capitalism was a return to communal living in small-scale communities without private property. This tradition of utopian socialism emerged from the writings and experiments of the French socialist Charles Fourier. The one who thought the seas would turn to lemonade after the revolution. Yep, that's him again. But he also thought that women should be totally free to choose their form of work and whatever style of intimate relationships they preferred outside of marriage or sexist divisions of labor. Followers of Foyer and the other utopian socialists like Henri de Saint-Simon and Robert Owen founded a variety of cooperative and communal living experiments, many of which offered greater freedom to women than elsewhere in society. These communities changed many lives and inspired future generations of radicals, but never spread beyond the margins of society to seriously destabilize the entrenched economic, political, or gender hierarchies. So, then we have the industrial socialists, communists, and early anarchists, attempting to organize male industrial workers. Since a larger pool of potential workers meant lower wages for the men in the factories, some promoted this idea of separate spheres. They reasoned that if women stayed home with the kids, they wouldn't be a drag on male wages, and they could fulfill their natural functions as mothers. Um, <laughs> there was a sort of chivalrous dimension to this, too. Uh -huh. <laughs> men needed to secure living wages so that they could protect their women from the miserable conditions of exploitation in the factories, not to mention the male violence to which they were especially vulnerable in those settings. Incidentally, it's worth mentioning, there were some early feminist organizers who took these sort of positions, too, feeling like a life of marriage and homemaking was the safest option available to women in those times. Given the options, it's better to be oppressed and coerced by one man you know than by many you don't? I guess so. But if you want anything from your life other than being an unpaid domestic and sexual servant to a man, that doesn't sound too promising. Right. So there's this contradiction in the thought of early radicals, who recognize women workers as having a unique double oppression as women and as workers. Pretty bold thinking for its time but then leads down a slippery slope into protectionism, even among anarchists. So then you get things like anarchist propaganda in Spain that uses images of young working-class women being raped by bourgeois men. Which did, in fact, happen at times, but in this propaganda, it was used both to intimidate women out of the wage workforce and to play on men's patriarchal feelings of ownership to sharpen class rage. Jesus. Or the delegates to the International Working Men's Association who came to a Congress in the 1870s with a proposal to eliminate daycare centers because they promote the capitalist exploitation of women by allowing them to integrate into the wage labor force. They legitimately thought this would be a progressive reform. And then there's Proudhon. Do we have to talk about Proudhon? <sighs> I'm afraid so. He was the first person we know of to identify as an anarchist, and his attitudes were hugely influential on subsequent generations of anarchists and radicals. He believed that some power hierarchies are legitimate, specifically the role of the father as the authority that brings culture to family life. In his schema, obedient and loyal women in the home exist as some kind of mystical initiator through which men become dignified and heroic and just. In that way, and only in that way, could women serve the revolutionary causes he espoused? He was profoundly threatened by feminism and wrote an entire book ranting against it in 1875 called Pornocracy or Women in Modern Times. Oh, make it I, stop. I know, I know. Now, he didn't just get away with that kind of nonsense without criticism. Some male anarchists spoke out against the sexism of their counterparts. As early as 1857, Joseph de Jacques, who was one of the first people to use the label anarchists as well, wrote a scathing criticism of Proudhon's reactionary views on gender. He asserted that the emancipation of women is nothing else than the emancipation of humanity, both sexes, and demanded that Proudhon stop calling himself an anarchist if he failed to see that. The Italian anarchist Malatesta spoke out in favor of feminist ideals and supported anarchist women's publications and critiques in the face of widespread scorn and resistance from other radicals. And then you have Bakunin, who saw parallels between his family's efforts to marry off his sisters, 
regardless of their wishes, and to compel him into military service. He promoted equal rights and economic independence for women and wrote, Oppressed women, your cause is indissolubly tied to the common cause of all the exploited workers, men and women. But unfortunately, Proudhon's defense of the patriarchal family as a consolation for male workers proved influential among anarchist men. The fairly obvious fact that opposing all authority requires opposing male authority over women, on the one hand, and the persistence of these sexist notions of male workers' revolution on the other hand, this core contradiction continued to plague anarchist movements for many generations to come. And to this day, we might even say. So, what about early feminists who weren't anarchists? From the 1820s onward, in Western Europe and the United States, middle-class women began to correspond with each other and organize. Early liberal feminists, drawing on the writings of Mary Wollstonecraft, emphasized the need for women's education and organized academies for girls and universities for women, as well as teacher training schools. Some early feminists stopped there. American reformer Catherine Beecher, for example, devoted her life to women's education, but believed in the ideology of separate spheres and opposed women's suffrage. Others, however, took their demands further. And as the movement spread to East Asia, South America, and beyond in the mid to late 19th century, women's organizations formed to speak out in support of political and property rights and legal equality. The suffragettes are probably the best known feminist trend of this era. While the goal to which they devoted their lives, women's right to vote, was certainly a liberal reform, the tactics they deployed could at times prove quite militant. In England, we have the Pankhurst sisters and their crew committing arson to get the vote. An example that while all our comrades may be militants, not all militants are necessarily our comrades. In the United States, their protege Alice Paul spoke out against police brutality, staged a hunger strike in jail, and was force-fed and beaten. But the National Women's Party she founded was really a single-issue campaign, indifferent to working class or anti-racist demands and silent on birth control. One of the best portrayals of the problems of this movement comes in the children's movie, Mary Poppins, when the British Lady of the House, in her expensive designer suffragette uniform, marches out singing and dancing to demand the vote. Uh, leaving behind a staff of working class women in their starched uniforms to service her children, husband, and Victorian home. We're clearly soldiers in petty coats and dauntless crusaders for women's votes. Though we adore men individually, we agree that as a group they're rather stupid. Mrs. Bank. In the United States, working-class women tended to place wage parity in educational and vocational training as a greater priority than voting. Some suffragettes attacked a broader range of women's issues. Susan B. Anthony spoke out against marriage as a necessity for economic survival, while Elizabeth Cady Stanton and abolitionist Lucy Stone wrote about domestic and sexual violence against women and children. But for the most part, once suffragettes won the right to vote, they disappeared as a movement. The burgeoning abolitionist movement spanning the Atlantic brought together women across boundaries of race and class. Black women, such as Sojourner Truth, challenged bourgeois definitions of womanhood by drawing on her experiences during slavery. While lesser-known activist Maria Stewart insisted that her fairer sisters not limit black women's opportunities for better paid work and higher education. And like 100 years later, during the Civil Rights Movement, participation in this liberation struggle woke some women to their own oppression. Abby Kelly wrote that, In striving to strike the male slave's irons off, we found most surely that we were manacled ourselves. Kelly and other abolitionists, like the Southern Grimkiss sisters, fought not just for the freedom of slaves, but for the freedom of women to speak in public. Coming from religious traditions that preached politics from the pulpit, to speak publicly was to lay claim to a traditionally male form of institutional power. Women active in reform movements could play on notions of the moral superiority of women, but hit barriers when their activism challenged entrenched male power. Some abolitionist groups, such as the all-black American Moral Reform Society, welcomed women as full members, stating that what is morally right for a man to do is morally right for a woman. 
On the other hand, the British and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society refused to accept women delegates. This exclusion led Elizabeth Cady Stanton to call the famous 1848 Seneca Falls meeting, which kicked off the women's rights movement. This movement hinged on the concept of women as an indivisible group, an idea that many feminists adopted for generations to come. As Nellie Roussel wrote in 1904, Among us there are no ruling classes, no privileged classes. All of us can declare war on today's society, for all of us are more or less ruined. Our bodies, our hearts, our consciences brutalized by its laws. Great ladies are mistreated by princely brutes, bourgeoisie dispossessed of their property, working women frustrated by their meager salaries. Similarly, British feminist Anne Kenny claimed, No nationality, no political creed, no class distinction, no difference of any sort divides us as women. One imagines that most working class women, not to say women of color and those in colonized lands, would have disagreed with that. These liberal feminists, predominantly though not exclusively middle class, varied in the breadth of their goals and tactics, but generally aspired to inclusion into the dominant structures of education, politics, and professional occupations. In contrast, as working class movements swept Europe and beyond in the late 19th century, the socialist women's movement came to predominate especially for the generation after the original suffragettes, as with Emmeline Pankhurst's daughter Sylvia, who steered her mother's party in the direction of labor reform. Influenced by Frederick Engels' analysis of the role of private property in women's subordination within the family, they saw a proletarian revolution as the only pathway to the liberation of women. Louise Somineau, a seamstress in France, formed a socialist women's group in response to what she called feminist confusionism, which attempted to maintain the class privileges of the intriguing, naive, deranged, and hysterical bourgeois feminists. Ouch. (laughs) Her counterpart in Germany was Clara Zetkin, the leader of the women's section of the Second International, who called for an International Proletarian Women's Day on March 19, 1911, that catalyzed demonstrations across the world. While she led a somewhat autonomous socialist women's movement separate from the party, She could be conservative on family issues and believed that reforms that liberated individuals distracted from the collective movement for all workers. She declared, Women workers who aspire to social equality do not expect emancipation through the bourgeois women's movement, which claims to be fighting for women's rights. The structure is based on sand and has no basis in reality. Working women are absolutely convinced that the question of women's emancipation cannot be isolated and exist in a vacuum, but that it must be seen as part of the great social question. They understand clearly that this question will never be resolved in our society as presently constituted, but only following the complete overthrow of this society. Well, in that point, socialist feminists and anarchist feminists find some common ground. But while anarchists joined the socialists in their critiques of liberal feminism, they weren't willing to totally subsume questions of women's emancipation into the class struggle, nor did they believe that state power or authoritarian party structures could lead to genuine liberation. Okay, enough beating around the bush. Let's get into it. What did early anarchist women believe in and fight for? Well, we should remember that it's not always possible to generalize. Women were active in all of the factions and divergences of anarchist thought, from individualists to communist anarchists, those focused on industrial organizing, and those more focused on communal living or cultural transformation, and such and so forth. And anarchist women from different countries and cultures confronted quite distinct political contexts and modes of male domination. But despite this diversity, we can trace many common themes from the writings and actions of these women. Let's see what they had to say. Early anarcho-feminist critiques centered around the recognition that the exploitation of women could not be separated from the overall context of political and economic exploitation. Women active in early anarchist movements insisted that women's emancipation wasn't simply an additional issue to tack on to a broader platform of liberation. Instead, they argued that radicals couldn't understand capitalism without understanding gender oppression as an integral dynamic within it. 
and that no anti-capitalist revolution would succeed without mobilizing women as equal partners within it. As Puerto Rican anarcho-feminist Luisa Capetilla wrote in 1911, the current social system with all its errors is sustained through the ignorance and enslavement of women. At the founding Congress of the Industrial Workers of the World in 1905, Lucy Parsons explained to the mostly male audience, We women are the slaves of slaves. We are exploited more ruthlessly than men. Whenever wages are to be reduced, the capitalist class use women to reduce them. And if there's anything that you men should do in the future, it is to organize the women. While seeing women's emancipation as crucially interrelated with anti-capitalist struggle, they weren't content to simply fold the former into the latter and insisted on recognizing the particular oppression experienced by women. As Volterine de Clare pointed out, a section of anarchists say there is no woman question apart from our present industrial situation. But the assertion is mostly made by men, and men are not the fittest to feel the slaveries of women. But this insistence on the inseparability of the women question from anti-capitalism distinguished anarchist women from many of their counterparts in the feminist movement, who, at least as many anarchists saw it, merely sought women's equal integration into an exploitative economy and corrupt political system. The primary focus of much feminist organizing in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was gaining the right to vote. Anarchists, unsurprisingly, were not excited about this campaign. Some male anarchists dismissed the women's suffrage movement as reactionary. Victor Yaros wrote in the American journal Liberty, Anarchists and individualists oppose women's suffrage simply and solely because they are convinced that women's political activity would be directed tyranny ward and would arrest the political emancipation of all of us. Anarchist women found themselves in a difficult position in which most of the organizing being undertaken by politicized women was directed towards a goal they didn't share. Yet opposition to it, including that of anarchist men, tended to reinforce sexist notions about women. In response, some anarchist women and men who supported women's emancipation tentatively supported the suffragettes. Some simply maintained that political equality between men and women was a step against tyranny, even if gaining the vote itself wasn't a revolutionary development. Others argued that extending the vote to women would speed their education in knowledge of the imperfections of human government, thus opening their consciousness to anarchist critiques of the state. In countries with anarchist movements but lacking visible women's suffrage struggles, anarchists sometimes translated and published the writings of the radical suffragettes from abroad. For example, in 1902, the Peruvian journal La Idea Libre began publishing a Seccion Feminista in each issue, which included suffragette texts from the United States. British anarchist Rose Whitcup recognized that this movement shows us that women who so far have been so submissive to their masters, the men are beginning to wake up at last to the fact they are not inferior to those masters. Yet she argued that women would not be freed by votes, but by their own strength. She denied that the British suffragettes are inspired by a new passion for liberty. I would say that the suffragette is inspired by the passion to govern. Likewise, Hazen saw male dominance and government as dual forces that had to be overthrown in tandem, thus criticized the suffragettes or advocates for women in government as merely reinforcing an inherently corrupting system. Along these lines, most anarchist women opposed or at least stood apart from the suffrage movement, attempting to assert a specifically anarchist but also feminist conception of women's struggle. As usual, Emma Goldman was one of the most uncompromising voices. In her essay on women's suffrage, she railed against the common suffragette argument that allowing women to vote would somehow purify politics. This excerpt reflects her rejection of both traditional and anarchist sexism, as well as the idealized arguments of the suffragettes and religious liberals, concluding with a comprehensive anarchist vision of women's liberation. She writes, Needless to say, I am not opposed to woman suffrage on the conventional ground that she is not equal to it. I see neither physical, psychological, nor mental reasons why woman should not have the equal right to vote with man. But that cannot possibly blind me to the absurd notion that woman will accomplish that wherein man has failed. If she would not make things worse, she certainly could not make them better. She can give suffrage or the ballot no new quality. 
nor can she receive anything from it that will enhance her own quality. Her development, her freedom, her independence must come from and through herself, first by asserting herself as a personality and not as a sex commodity. Second, by refusing the right to anyone over her body, by refusing to bear children unless she wants them, by refusing to be a servant to God, the state, society, the husband, the family, etc., by making her life simpler but deeper and richer. That is, by trying to learn the meaning and substance of life in all its complexities, by freeing herself from the fear of public opinion and public condemnation. Only that, and not the ballot, will set woman free, will make her a force hitherto unknown in the world, a force for real love, for peace, for harmony, a force of divine fire, of life-giving, a creator of free men and women. Succinctly, but no less eloquently, Lily Gare Wilkinson put it this way, If I, for one, had the vote, if I had all the votes in the country, I would scorn to use that right, as they call it, to do so great a wrong to freedom. If all the voting papers in the world were at my disposal, the only use I should put them to would be to build one great bonfire of them and call upon the people to come round and rejoice while I set them ablaze. Okay, so for these anarchists, voting wasn't going to lead to the emancipation of women. How did they think it would come about? Well, for one, since they understood women's emancipation as part of a total revolution in social relations based in the overthrow of capitalism, they believed it could only come as a part of joint struggle, as equals alongside men. In contrast to some early feminist traditions that emphasized women's difference, the notion that caring maternal women would purify politics if they could vote and such, many anarchist women emphasized their similarity to men in capacity and interest while discussing their distinct experiences of oppression based on gender. As Voltaire Declare wrote, the mental constitution of woman, like that of man, has never failed to rise where restrictions upon equal freedom have been torn down. Whenever woman has had the same opportunity as man, Results have proven that her capacities for development are as unlimited as his. Complete and true emancipation of woman, contended Emma Goldman, will have to do away with the absurd notion of the dualism of the sexes, or that man and woman represent two antagonistic worlds. As such, anarchist women of this era generally rejected any hint of separatism. British anarchist Lily Gare Wilkinson's statement is pretty representative. Woman's emancipation is not to be attained apart from man's emancipation, nor, for that matter, man's apart from woman's. But being slaves together, they will gain true emancipation when they strive together for freedom. Even when forming autonomous women's organizations, anarchists were careful to point out that men's and women's liberation were inextricably bound up together. The first issue of the Spanish Mujeres Libres journal clarified that its mission was not a declaration of war between the sexes, rather it aimed for rapprochement. Mutuality of interests, easing of anxieties, eagerness to join in the struggle for a common destiny. In contrast to feminism, which they understood as simply the reverse of masculinist errors they decried, they articulated a vision of what they called integral humanism, or as Federica Monsigny put it bluntly, Feminism? Never. Humanism, always. Criticisms of men in general were redirected toward the capitalist economy and hierarchical structure of government and society. Not to let men off the hook, but to recognize shared interests between men and women in dismantling exploitation. As Chinese anarcho-feminist He Zen wrote, You women, do not hate the man. Hate that you don't have food to eat. Why don't they have food to eat? Because they can't buy food without money. Why don't they have money? Because the rich have stolen our property and walked all over the majority of the people. She summarized her vision of anarcho-feminism as an end to all hierarchy. What we mean by equality of the sexes is not just that men will no longer oppress women. We also want men to no longer be oppressed by men and women to no longer be oppressed by other women. Completely overthrow rulership. 
force men to abandon all their special privileges and become equal to women, and make a world with neither the oppression of women nor the oppression of men. And this emphatic rejection of reinscribing gender hierarchies in the reverse, anarchist women followed their foremother, Mary Wollstonecraft, who wrote at the close of the 18th century, I do not wish women to have power over men, but over themselves. Yes, sir. But how would women come to have power over themselves? Economic autonomy from men constituted an especially crucial part of women's struggles for the power to determine their own lives. And this, the anarchists agreed with socialist feminists such as Clara Zetkin, who maintained that woman would remain in subjugation until she is economically independent. This proved especially central to the critiques of more individualist anarchists. As Voltaire and de Clare emphasized, Without the independence of women, there can be no equality, and without equality, no true adjustment of sex relations. Many of the efforts of Mujeres Libres in Spain during the Civil War and Revolution were oriented toward technical education and employment programs for women, with the goal of empowering them to support themselves without reliance on male partners, as well as participating in workplace organizing and collectivized industries. However, Anarchists rooted in anti-capitalism did not see women's entry into the wage labor force as liberating in and of itself. On the contrary, they attacked the dual exploitation that women workers faced in the factories as well as in the home. As Emma Golden pointed out, As to the great mass of working girls and women, how much independence is gained if the narrowness and lack of freedom in the home is exchanged for the narrowness and lack of freedom of the factory, sweatshop, department store, or office? In addition is the burden which is laid on many women of looking after a home sweet home after a day's hard work. Glorious independence. No wonder that hundreds of girls are so willing to accept the first offer of marriage, sick and tired of their independence, behind the counter at the sewing or typewriting machine. But unlike the patronizing efforts of some radicals we discussed before, who thought that protecting women from exploitation meant keeping them in the home as wives and mothers, anarchist women insisted that women be able to participate in economic life and anti-capitalist struggle however they chose. Maria Lacerda de Mora criticized anarchist men who opposed spreading birth control information, declaring... For them, women is just a fertile and inexhaustible womb, destined to produce bourgeois soldiers, or more accurately, red soldiers for the social revolution. The late 19th century Argentinian anarcho-feminist newspaper La Voz de la Mujer referred to men who failed to support women's emancipation as false anarchists and warned men that they had better understand once and for all that our mission is not reducible to raising your children and washing your clothes and that we also have a right to emancipate ourselves and be free from all kinds of tutelage, whether economic or marital. Anarchist women reported widespread frustration over the clash between their male comrades' nominal support for the equality of women, but consistent resistance to its practice. In 1923 in Spain, Soledad Gustavo wrote, a man may like the idea of the emancipation of women, but he is not so fond of her actually practicing it. In the end, he may desire the other's woman, but he will lock up his own. Voltairine de Clare raged against similar experiences among American anarchist men. So pickled is the male creation with the vinegar of authoritarianism that even those who have gone further and repudiated the state still cling to the gods, society as it is, still hug the old theological idea that they are to be heads of the family. No longer than a week since, a so-called anarchist said to me, I will be the boss in my own house. A communist anarchist, if you please, who doesn't believe in my house. About a year ago, a noted libertarian speaker said in my presence that his sister should stay at home with her children. That is her place. The old church idea. This man was a socialist, and since then an anarchist. Yet his highest idea for woman was serfhood to husband and children in the present mockery called home. While I give to you and you give to me True love 
In response to this entrenched sexism focusing on restricting women's livelihood and sexuality to their roles as wives and mothers, many anarchist women focused critiques on the institution of marriage. They condemned it as the core institution connecting religion, the state, and women's economic and sexual subordination. Some, such as Hei Zen in China, criticized the capitalist economy for forcing women to choose marriage partners out of economic dependency and desperation rather than their own desires. Others, like Louise Michel in France, maintained that they rejected marriage to remain free for the coming revolution. Emma Goldman condemned marriage as an institution that degrades love, which she sees as the basis for art, beauty, reconciliation between the sexes, and a free society. Marriage and love have nothing in common. They are, in fact, antagonistic to each other. As she saw it, marriage is primarily an economic arrangement, making women dependent and incapable of autonomy and fulfillment. And to the notion that it protects women, she declares, The very idea is so revolting, such an outrage, an insult on life, so degrading to human dignity as to forever condemn this parasitic institution. On the other hand, Love is the strongest and deepest element in all life, the harbinger of hope, of joy, of ecstasy. Love, the defier of all laws, of all conventions. Love, the freest, most powerful molder of human destiny. How can such an all-compelling force be synonymous with that poor little state-in-church-begotten weed marriage? Voltaire Declare condemned the stigma attached to child-rearing outside of marriage, spoke out against the rape of wives by their husbands, which remained legal in some parts of the U.S. into the 1990s, and condemned the institution of marriage as sexual slavery. As she declares to married men, the earth is a prison, the marriage bed is a cell, women are the prisoners, and you are the keepers. In some anarchist movements, in which critiques of the state and the church had made legal and religious marriage taboo, unions or revolutionary organizations began to perform ceremonies of partnership between men and women, such as the Casamientos a la Libertaria in Spain. Mujeres Libres mocked these ceremonies as paltry imitations of an oppressive institution and insisted that interpersonal relationships should remain only the business of the individuals involved. So if marriage was not to be the basis for romantic relationships, then what? Free love, suggested many anarchists, freely choosing one's partners outside of marriage, unmediated by state contracts or religious ceremonies, and freely dissolved at the wish of either party. The term, as it was used in the late 19th and early 20th century, didn't hold quite the same meaning as it would take on in the 1960s hippie generations. Rather than indiscriminate promiscuity or even non-monogamy, free love was generally understood in practice as serial heterosexual monogamy, simply without the baggage of the state or the church governing it. But social revolution would clear the way for individuals to freely choose whatever forms of intimacy they desired. As Lola Iturbe, a Spanish journalist and supporter of Mujeres Libres, wrote in 1933, Only the reign of libertarian communism can provide a human solution to the problem of women's emancipation. With the destruction of private property, this hypocritical morality will fall by the wayside, and we will be free. We will experience love with the complete freedom of our appetites, respecting all the various forms of amorous and sexual life. To Volturine Declare, an individualist anarchist, this connects to the importance of women maintaining autonomy in both economic and emotional terms, avoiding what we might call today codependency. She clarifies, It is of no importance to me whether this is a polygamous, polyandric, or monogamous marriage, nor whether it is blessed by a priest, permitted by a magistrate, contracted publicly or privately, or not contracted at all. It is the permanent dependent relationship which, I affirm, is detrimental to the growth of individual character, and to which I am unequivocally opposed. That love and respect may last, I would have unions rare and impermanent. That life may grow, I would have men and women remain separate personalities. 
Have no common possessions with your lover more than you might freely have with one not your lover. Because I believe that marriage stales love, brings respect into contempt, outrages all the privacies, and limits the growth of both parties. I believe that they who marry do ill. As Declare emphasized, her critique was rooted in feminism and individualism, advocating for autonomy rather than sexual liberation, per se. The word polyamory that we use today wasn't coined until the end of the 20th century. When folks spoke of non-monogamous relationships in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, they sometimes used the term sexual varietism or plural love. Some anarchist women explicitly advocated varietism, such as Maria Lacerda de Mora, who insisted, love has always been in open struggle with monogamy, promoting plural love as a solution to jealousy as well as prostitution and sexual exploitation. Most, however, focused their critiques on the state and church institutions that regulated personal liberty, as well as the impoverishment of capitalism that deformed human intimacy. Volterine de Clare argued that sexual arrangements were dictated by economic relations in the future. Whether monogamy or variety will then obtain depends on which of these systems produces the higher type of humanity. At present, it is impossible to decide, she concluded. Not all anarchist women were comfortable with the discussions of free love and varietism. In 1896, Lucy Parsons wrote to the Firebrand, an anarchist newspaper, condemning it for publishing articles on free love and varietism. She condemned the paper's attempts to dig up the hideous variety grub and bind it to the beautiful unfolding blossom of labor's emancipation from wage slavery and call them one and the same. Variety in sex relations and economic freedom have nothing in common, nor has it anything in common with anarchism. She lived with her lovers without marriage herself, as Emma Goldman rather cattily mentioned in replying to the critique. But Parsons saw questions of labor and economics as the proper agenda for anarchist agitation, and saw questions of sexuality and personal relationships as diversions that alienated anarchism as a serious political movement from its working class base. In fact, she took Emma Goldman to task for addressing middle class audiences with discussions of art, literature, and sexuality, rather than devoting her efforts to swaying the proletariat. Others pointed out that the miseries that unrestricted sexuality could visit on women in the form of the burden of raising unwanted children alone in this era before widely available birth control methods and sex education. Without promoting restrictions on sexuality by the state or religious morality, they nonetheless criticized efforts by anarchists, many of them male, to promote open sexuality between men and women outside of committed relationships. Emma Goldman condemned Puritanism in American culture as the cause of sexual repression, ignorance, and grievous consequences to women's health and happiness, including abortions and venereal disease. She was one of the first public speakers to defend homosexuality, supporting Oscar Wilde during his trial on charges of sodomy and gross indecency, and mentioning same-sex desire compassionately, if patronizingly, in her lectures. While a few radicals, such as good old Charles Lemonade C.'s Fourier, had explicitly stated that in a free society, all would be free to pursue sexual desires across lines of gender, the majority remained uncomfortable with the notions of sexual liberation outside of a heterosexual norm. The Argentinian anarcho-feminist journal La Voz de la Mujer condemned what it called degenerate sex as a sign of the degradation of the bourgeoisie, and levied charges of homosexuality against priests and the wealthy to inflame working-class indignation. Even in Emma Goldman's own Mother Earth journal, a condescending article criticizing middle-class feminism referred to it as an amusing example of feminine intellectual homosexuality, anticipating the whole lavender menace debate of the 1970s. Jugo de tomate frío en las venas. En las venas de veras tener. Prostitution was addressed by many anarchist women, though different groups and individuals promoted different positions in relation to it as a social and economic phenomena. One common rhetorical strategy of anarchist women was to make anti-capitalist arguments that drew on moralistic public outrage against prostitution, as well as stigma against prostitutes. 
if capitalist wage labor involves selling one's labor by the hour to profit someone else, how is it meaningfully different when a male factory worker does that versus when a female prostitute does, if you strip away the moralism? For example, Chinese anarcho-feminist He Zhen, in explaining why increased entry of women into the wage labor force did not constitute liberation, wrote that capitalists force countless women into selling their bodies. Anciently, people regarded women as playthings. Today, they regard women as tools. Regarding women as playthings insulted their bodies alone. Regarding women as tools both insults their bodies and exhausts their strength. Truly, the crimes of the capitalists reach to heaven. According to Emma Goldman, the prevalence of prostitution is a direct consequence of the impoverishment women suffer under capitalism combined with a puritanical and sexually repressive society. The institutions that condemn it most shrilly are the very ones that cause it to flourish. As she writes in The Traffic and Women, Moralists are ever ready to sacrifice one half of the human race for the sake of some miserable institution which they cannot outgrow. Rather than ranting about immorality and punishing prostitutes, she proposed sex education, access to birth control, and abandoning repressive morality, along with the abolition of industrial wage slavery. The Mujeres Libres during the Spanish Revolution took efforts to eliminate prostitution, which they viewed as the greatest of slaveries, emblematic of the exploitation of life under capitalism. They proposed establishing a network of liberatorios de prostitución, centers offering support to women working as prostitutes and encouraging them to leave their profession and join the revolutionary movement. However, others in the movement saw prostitution as inevitable and made efforts to organize prostitutes into unions. Luisa Capetillo believed that both men and women had avid natural sex drives that needed expression. Therefore, outside of the context of capitalism, prostitution, for both men and women, could have positive health effects for young unmarried people. At the same time, in one of her plays, she drew on the cultural taboo against prostitution to make an argument for free love. One of the characters says to young women in the audience, if you want to be mothers of conscientious generations and to be free, don't make contracts at the civil registry, nor in temples, because that is a sale, and the sale is prostitution. Love ought to be free, like the air you breathe, like the flowers that open to receive the fertile pollen and offer their perfumes into the air. Many anarchist women, like Capetillo, used the stigma against prostitution as a way of making arguments against marriage, which they saw as little more than a formalized, socially acceptable prostitution, or against capitalism, which reduces all people to commodities on the market. Louise Michel mentioned that she always looked upon marriage without love as a kind of prostitution. Lily Gare Wilkinson wrote of the three types of women in bondage, the lady sold in marriage, the working woman, and the prostitute. The bondage of these three types is different in kind, but the manner of entering bondage is the same in all three cases. All these women enter bondage by selling their bodies, selling them for a man's pleasure or selling them for the profit of an employer. It is clear that women are driven to this degradation, not because of the domination of some big abstraction called man, but because of the domination of those human laws by which both men and women are forbidden the free use and enjoyment of the earth they live upon. And how would women's emancipation come about? Unlike the suffragettes and liberal feminists, anarchist women insisted that only women could emancipate themselves. Neither men, nor laws and the state, nor reforms granted by the powerful, nor the operations of the capitalist economy would provide true liberation. Hei Zen distinguished between women's liberation that stemmed from women being passive agents, where men granted liberation to women, and from women being active agents, women struggling for liberation with their own might. Only the latter would result in genuine emancipation and the power to determine their own destinies. Goldman, Declare, and Frederica Mancini strongly criticized women for being complicit in their own oppression by their support of religion, marriage, patriotism, war, beauty norms, and politicians. Women had to take responsibility for rejecting the institutions and values that kept them ignorant and dependent on men. Direct action was the solution. 
For those fighting the exploitation of their bosses, organizing and sabotage, as promoted by Lucy Parsons and Voltaire de Clare. For those trapped into marriages or dominated in relationships with men, free unions entered and dissolved at will between equals, as advocated by Emma Goldman and Louisa Capetillo. And for emancipation from all of the constraints of gender, a struggle for total liberation, alongside men, though working autonomously when necessary, until capitalism is destroyed and true human freedom can flourish for all. This episode has just offered a quick survey of the first century of anarcho-feminism. But if any of the people or issues we mentioned strike your interest, we have reference materials and more info available in the show notes on our website, crimethink.com slash podcast. And when we conclude our discussion of anarcho-feminism in a future episode, we'll explore how the radical critiques of these early anarchist women laid the groundwork for the second wave feminist movement and contemporary anarchist perspectives on gender and power. And now it's time for The Chopping Block, where we review anarchist texts that offer insight into the themes we explore in our episodes. Today we're taking a look at one of the most fascinating and useful accounts of anarchist history published in recent years, Free Women of Spain by Martha Acklesberg. In these episodes on early anarchist women, we've begun from the mid-19th century, when anarchists first began to organize under that label, and continued until about World War II. That timing isn't just arbitrary. Anarchist movements that were strong in the early 20th century, especially in Europe, reached their apex in the 1930s in the struggle against emerging fascism. Perhaps the largest of all was in Spain, where masses of people organized into large unions and federations contested the power of the state and capitalism. As we discussed in episode 12, the Spanish Civil War stimulated the hopes of anarchists across the world, who had struggled against severe repression in the capitalist countries as well as in revolutionary Russia. In 1936 and 37, hundreds of thousands of people collectivized agricultural and industrial production and challenged social hierarchies, while thousands of supporters from around the world poured in to volunteer in the militias against General Franco. When the fascists defeated the Popular Front, most of the brightest lights of the anarchist movement were killed or scattered into exile, bringing a long era of anarchist activity to a close. In the 75 years since, many anarchists have studied the Spanish anarchist movement to see what lessons we can learn for our struggles today. However, most of the traditional anarchist histories of the Spanish Revolution that emerged in the first decades afterwards scarcely mention women. Apart from a few prominent figures, we knew little about how half the population experienced the anarchist movement and the social revolution that nearly came to fruition. Enter Martha Acklesberg, a professor of government and women's studies involved in the burgeoning American feminist movement. In the late 1970s, while researching Civil War-era collectivizations in Spain, she encountered a group of young anarchist women who were organizing under the name Mujeres Libres, Free Women, in reference to an anarchist women's group that had been active decades before. This piqued Acklesberg's curiosity, and over the next years, she began to track down, befriend, and interview many older women who had been involved in the original Mujeres Libres, founded in 1936 and lasting until the defeat of the revolution three years later. Over many visits and travels across Spain and France, she amassed stories, documents, and recollections about this mysterious group, and shaped them into a study that originally came out in 1991. A revised edition was released through AK Press in 2004. But first, a disclaimer. In a way, it's misguided for us to include a discussion of Mujeres Libres in an episode on anarcho-feminism for the simple reason that the organization was explicitly not feminist. It's not just that to label them as such would be anachronistic. On the contrary, there were feminists organizing as such in Spain at the time against whom Mujeres Libres defined themselves. In the first pages of the book, Acklesberg cites their former national vice secretary, Suceso Portales, who declares quite unambiguously, we are not, and we were not then, 
feminists. But why not? After all, these were revolutionaries who organized autonomously as women to fight for their emancipation. As Portales clarifies, we were not fighting against men. We did not want to substitute a feminist hierarchy for a masculine one. It's necessary to work, to struggle, together, because if we don't, we'll never have a social revolution. But we needed our own organization to struggle for ourselves. This perspective surprised Acklesberg, who writes that she had always assumed that feminism meant opposition to hierarchies of any sort. In other words, feminism as anarchism, along the lines of the definition we offered in episode 26. This tension between women's need to struggle to emancipate themselves and the centrality of a unified social revolution as the ultimate goal lies at the heart of Free Women of Spain. And as such, it's the perfect book for us to examine in our discussion of anarcho-feminism, as it offers a tantalizing glimpse into how many thousands of anarchist women, self-described feminists or not, understood their struggles for liberation. The book's first chapter, Anarchist Revolution and Their Liberation of Women, should be required reading for anyone passionate about anarchism. In just 25 pages, it offers an accessible introduction to anarchism and its implications for women and the struggle against patriarchy. It lays out a theoretical understanding of domination and subordination versus community and equality, the role of sexuality in the family, the importance of direct action, and consistency of means and ends in revolutionary transformation, using early 20th century Spain as a case study. Subsequent chapters provide thorough context for the emergence of the organization, describing Spanish working-class anarchist movements and the role women played in and around them, and then tracing the unfolding of the Civil War and Social Revolution. Against this backdrop, she explores the creation of Mujeres Libres, the programs they founded and the positions they took, and how they related both to non-anarchist women's organizations and to the male-dominated anarchist movement. In her conclusion, she examines the meanings of empowerment, diversity, and difference to the organization, arguing that their legacy can open up a new conception of politics to contemporary feminists and radicals. Mujeres Libres emerged from the experiences of marginalization active women militants suffered within the CNT, the major anarcho-syndicalist organization in Spain. In Madrid, Barcelona, and other parts of Catalonia, women began forming study and cultural groups, building a network of women involved in anarchist organizations, providing child care to union delegates, and writing critical articles on women's emancipation in the anarchist press. In 1936, they published the first issue of a journal titled Mujeres Libres, which stated its aim as awakening the female conscience towards libertarian ideas. As the war and social revolution broke out, the organization developed a variety of programs intended to pursue the goals of capacitación, which translates to something between consciousness raising and empowerment, and captación, mobilizing and incorporating women into the anarchist movement and the emerging revolution. Their initiatives included a wide range of educational programs, political and cultural as well as technical and professional, employment programs to support women's economic autonomy, hospitals and healthcare projects, services for refugees, non-combat support for the war effort, as well as support for women fighting in the militias, and more. They insisted on their organizational autonomy, despite a lack of support from the larger anarchist and revolutionary groups, and remained actively engaged with thousands of women until the fall of Barcelona in 1939 to fascist forces. From her rich trove of personal interviews as well as old Mujeres Libres journals and other primary sources, Acklesberg offers direct insight into the analysis and aspirations of these women. The book crackles with lively quotations and anecdotes and paints a vivid picture of the revolutionary ferment and sense of radical possibility in 1930s Spain. Although it was originally an academic study, it's quite enjoyable to read, and the comprehensive background it offers really helps to make sense of the organization's politics and programs. By the end of the book, I knew so much more than I had before, not only about Mujeres Libres itself, but about anarchist political theory in general, Spanish anarchist and working class history, feminist conceptions of politics, early 20th century debates around gender and sexuality, and so much more. If I had to make a critique of it, I'd point out that the book doesn't frame the contemporary political significance of Mujeres Libres in quite the same terms as I would. For example, 
Ecclesburg's suggestion that we examine their legacy for how it can inform participatory democratic politics today seems to miss the mark. Nowhere in the quotes she includes from members of Mujeres Libres did any of them cite democracy as a framework for understanding their revolutionary anarchism. They fought for women's emancipation, for capacitacion or empowerment, and above all, for social revolution. But the language of democracy, so beloved to Americans, including American radicals, doesn't appear to have been significantly relevant for them. And in Spain today, many of the forces carrying on the Mujeres Libres tradition of direct action are highly critical of democracy and its discourse, as were many anarchists involved in the recent rebellions in Barcelona in the Plaza Occupation Movement. In contrast, groups such as Democracia Real Ya, Real Democracy Now!, one of the major forces in the M15 movement of the plazas, opposed many anarchist initiatives and put forward explicitly liberal goals centered around reforming the electoral system to increase citizen participation in government. To truly understand the legacy of Mujeres Libres, we should assess them not through a misguided democratic lens, but on their own terms, as rebels against the state and politics, as well as against male domination within and beyond the revolutionary movement. This misframing is my only substantial criticism of the book, and this doesn't significantly detract from its usefulness or clarity as I see it. All in all, Free Women of Spain offers a compelling glimpse into a crucial and often overlooked dimension of one of the most studied periods of anarchist history. The experiences of Mujeres Libres offer insight into the elusive goal of women's emancipation that anarchists have so often advocated in theory but resisted in practice, as well as a striking challenge to feminisms that see that emancipation as a process of gaining legal rights and state power. It's up to anarchists, feminists, and rebels of today to define the true significance of Mujeres Libres as we build on their legacy in our struggles. Free Women of Spain is available from AK Press. You can also read a PDF version online via libcom.org. We've got the link posted on our website. <laughs>